Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. I'm Pete Peterson, Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and we are coming to you live from Malibu, California, and the graduate campus of the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Today is the last session of our April short courses, and not only the last session of uh, this particular class, but also of the three classes that we've been offering as part of these April courses. It's been wonderful to uh, get all the compliments back on, on how the courses have been going. Obviously, this was an idea that was, was hatched very early on as we saw the pandemic beginning to strike. It was our hope that we would be able to provide programming that would provide community to you, to uh, students, uh, prospective students, alums, friends, supporters of the School of Public Policy, and we hope that you've enjoyed these sessions as much as I have being across the table from three terrific faculty here at the Policy School, Dr. McClay, Dr. Lloyd, and for this session, Dr. Robert Kaufman. This will be the last session then in Dr. Kaufman's series, Trump's Principled Realism and the Major Themes in U.S. Farm Policy, where Dr. Kaufman has been exploring uh, a number of different um, public policy and foreign policy decisions made by the Trump administration in light of ongoing major themes uh, for American foreign policy uh, going all the way back to our founding. Today, Dr. Kaufman will uh, discuss a series of events and decisions and proposals very much in line with uh, current events and the response of the United States to the COVID-19 pandemic, which in ways we are beginning to take more and more seriously is not just a crisis of healthcare uh, policy, but is a crisis of farm policy. And as Dr. Kaufman is one of our longtime faculty here at the Policy School, and as we prepare public leaders who are going into what I call a, a post-COVID-19 world, uh, these decisions around farm policy will be as crucial as ones made in other areas of public policy. Dr. Robert Kaufman is a political scientist specializing in American foreign policy, national security, international relations, and various aspects of American politics. He has earned six degrees, including his PhD from Columbia University, his JD from Georgetown, and recently an LLM uh, from Pepperdine's Caruso School of Law. He's the author of several books, including his most recent Dangerous Doctrine, How Obama's Grand Strategy Weakened America from 2016, uh, as well as In Defense of the Bush Doctrine, uh, which you can see is a, a series of books about American uh, foreign policy in different presidential administrations. This particular series is being derived from some of the work uh, Dr. Kaufman is doing in researching for his forthcoming book about President Trump and his farm policy. I don't think many of you are, are new to the Zoom platform. I see a lot of familiar names and faces on our screen here. But if you are, we are using the Zoom platform. Um, this is a, a way that we can provide an interactive class here. Uh, the format for these classes is that Dr. Kaufman will begin with around 40 or 45 minutes of lecture and we will reserve the final 15 minutes or so uh, for your good questions. Questions should be answered through the chat feature. And so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon that says chat. Simply click on that, type in your question whenever you'd like, and I'll be sure to get to those questions towards the end of our session. So without any further ado, we begin our last session here with Dr. Kaufman, and I welcome you into LC 155 here at the School of Public Policy and turn the class over to our professor, Dr. Robert Kaufman. Thanks, Dean Peterson, for the introduction, a kind introduction. Uh, thank you, listeners, whoever's coming back for their forbearance and uh, 
whoever's listening for the first time for giving us a try. I'm going to talk today summing up what I've discussed about President Trump, about the significance of President Trump's presidency for international relations, some of the things that will endure from President Trump's approach, regardless of what happens in subsequent elections, what may be specific to President Trump and what is contingent, depends upon how we react to things. Whether people like President Trump or not, history is going to treat him as a consequential president, one of the most consequential uh, in many years. And the reason is that President Trump, whether you like his answers, is both a catalyst and a symptom of a fundamental recalibration of American national security that had to take place sooner or later, uh, regardless of who the president of the United States was. As I made um, the point in my first lecture, Obama, in some ways, much different in terms of substance, but conceptually, Obama also began the process, for good or ill in his case, of attempting to refashion American foreign policy to the conditions of the 21st century. That was long overdue. And while you can quarrel with uh, President Obama's approach, I do, and President Trump's, which I quarrel with much less, it was long overdue. And what Trump brought to the table was inevitable and consequential. And much of what he has to say will live on regardless of the outcome of the 2020 election. The coronavirus, to give this watershed time historical context, is a game changer that nobody anticipated. I won't be here to uh, receive your insults and I told you so, but here's a prediction. The coronavirus is going to go down as a watershed in American foreign policy. Every bit as significant as America's entry into World War I, every bit as significant as Pearl Harbor, every bit as significant as the United States after World War II redefining our role in the world to become the world's default power in vital geopolitical regions, first to deter the evil empire of the Soviet Union and continuing that after the fall of the Soviet Union to deal with a multiplicity of threats and opportunities in the three main power centers of the world, the Indo-Pacific, Europe, and the Middle East. What's different about the coronavirus, besides not having the benefit of hindsight, it all turned out well despite the cost with these previous watershed challenges, is that we don't know what's going to happen and some of the conditions are different than they were in past situations and past impulse reactions to crisis. Historically, even when we've been through difficult, challenging events before, and the entry into World War I was every bit as disputatious as President Trump's presidency. Until Pearl Harbor, there was a virulent anti-interventionist constituency symbolized by America First and Lindbergh ferociously committed to keeping the United States out of war. What ended domestic controversy was World War II. So domestic controversy is not new. That's part and parcel of an open and free society. What may be new to the detriment of American security 
is whether we have moved into a situation where we're not going to replicate what we've always done in the past when we've faced these challenges. When we face these challenges in the past, previous disputes have vanished into the ether or at least been suspended, and a new consensus is forged that despite our differences, we are all united at the water's edge to deal with the fundamental threat. Whether that was the Kaiser's Germany, or whether that was the Japanese and Nazi Germany after Pearl Harbor, or whether it was the Soviet Union, at least for the first 20 years of the Cold War, although it was increasingly contentious domestically, how and whether to respond in the final 20 years of the Cold War. What's different now to the detriment of a strong effective response is that there are not the building blocks to bipartisanship that existed particularly during the Cold War, uh, the early phase at least. Whatever the differences between Republicans and Democrats coming out of World War II. Once Harry Truman gave his speech on the necessity of the Truman Doctrine to aid Greece and Turkey, once George Kennan published his Mr. X article and the debate unfolded, despite all the differences between Republicans and Democrats, and there were some outliers, there was a united national purpose among the preponderance of Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. about the need for vigilant muscular internationalism, not only to deter the Soviet threat, but also to provide the structure for a world that did not return to the conditions that led to World War I and World War II. Uh, sadly, at this moment, that tradition, that bipartisan tradition, doesn't seem to be a plausible short-term option, nor may it be a long-term option. During the Cold War, there was a robust muscular tradition in the Democratic Party, symbolized by Harry Truman, later John Kennedy, later Scoot Jackson, and in the end, probably the final example of this tradition, Joe Lieberman, former senator of Connecticut, Al Gore's running mate in 2000, committed to muscular internationalism, as has the Republican Party been committed since 1948. That's no longer the case at least for the foreseeable future, and I would be delighted to be surprised, I don't see in the Democratic Party any of the impulses that would lead to a 21st century version of muscular internationalism dealing with China. Even in the Republican Party, that proposition is contested rather than assured, but the impulse for muscular internationalism modified to fit some of the legitimate concerns President Trump has raised about reciprocity and burden sharing seems plausibly to exist. I'm not sure that's the case and that's going to make dealing with the coronavirus in general and the genesis of it, Chinese ambitions, exceedingly difficult, much more difficult than past experiences, where we could count on a strong bipartisan response to deal with the dominant existential national security threat, despite the things that would inevitably divide us on specifics in foreign policy and on domestic politics. Right now, unfortunately, there seems to be no prospect on the horizon for forging a consensus on what the threat is, who the most dangerous country is, and what to do about it. Trump's instincts and record on the China issue, the dominant issue of the next part of the 21st century, 
is vastly more suited to the challenges China poses than the Democratic Party in general and what we've heard from Joe Biden in particular. Indeed, uh, this past week, the eminent Walter Russell Mead published a column in the Wall Street Journal arguing that no longer being able to run on the economy, President Trump's best chance for re-election is to run on the issue of China, where he has been more prescient than almost anybody else in American politics for the past three decades. The coronavirus has underscored, feasted on steroids, to change the metaphor, what we should have known, but elites didn't. China is indeed not a partner for peace, but the dominant threat in the world's most important geopolitical power center, the Indo-Pacific. Ideally, or as my heroes from Hawthorne, California, the Beach Boys would say, wouldn't it be nice if the next president could forge a consensus based on that understanding with the following concrete policies flowing from identifying the gravity and extent of the strategic and value-based threat that China poses rooted in the character of Chinese tyranny and the Noxus ideology that impels it. Wake up America. What China seeks is not stability compatible with the legitimate interests of other powers, including the United States. What China seeks is dominant, not just in the Indo-Pacific, which would be unacceptable enough, but globally. Look at Chinese document number nine, look at Chinese behavior, look at their deeds, not just their disinformation to the West. What would a sound, prudent policy toward China entail? And here I think Trump is closer to the mark by far than any of the plausible alternatives. One, it would entail continuing President Trump's military buildup, not only quantitatively, rebuilding our Navy, rebuilding our Air Force, but qualitatively in new threshold dimensions of warfare, such as space, cyber, ballistic missile defense, biosecurity, and economic security that reshores many industries that are essential for national security, biotechnology, rare metals, many other things that we have unwisely and fecklessly outsourced, not only in general, but to the main enemy we face. That's uh, giving, to quote Lenin, not as in John Paul Lingo and George, but Vladimir Ilyich, our enemy, the rope by which to hang us. That has to stop. And one thing that has to occur for the United States to restore the preponderance of American military power that has dangerously eroded over the past eight years before Trump under Obama, based on the assumption that American power was the problem, was to continue this military buildup. One of the things I'm going to uh, emphasize here is the contingency of things, which is something that um, grand theories of politics don't like. Uh, theories of politics like it's either inevitable, for instance, we're going to decline, or China's going to be number one, or it's inevitable they won't. The truth lies in between. It depends on what we do or don't do. The good news on the defense front, which is provisional good news, as the Wall Street Journal reports a few days ago, Tom Cotton and others in Congress have introduced a bill not only to increase defense spending in the Indo-Pacific, but specifically target that defense spending 
to the multidimensional nature of the Chinese gathering danger on land, at sea, in the air, in space, and in the realm of cyber. That proposal is contingent on following it up, by no means assured. But any robust policy toward China must continue the military buildup that President Trump has initiated. One of the most dangerous aspects of the corona crisis uh, that has not been given sufficient attention, and certainly it's an acute short-term danger, is our enemies are going to be very tempted to take advantage of us being distracted, understandably, by the massive dimensions of the corona catastrophe, which Chinese negligence and post-corona malice of forethought uh, has confronted the United States. You may not know it, but you should because it's a harbinger of things to come, that China has intensified its provocative behavior, already provocative, in the East and South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, against its Muslims in Xinjiang, intensifying its repression of its citizens in Hong Kong, betraying what China promised when Hong Kong returned to Chinese sovereignty in the first place in 1998. That was a harbinger of what we've seen in Corona. The Chinese make a deal, renege on a deal, and we seem to learn nothing from this pattern of behavior that gives rise to the observation attributed wrongly to Einstein that insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting different results. To quote Demosthenes to the Athenians, regarding the failure of appeasing Philip of Macedon, don't do what you're doing now. That is opposite when we're dealing with China. So the first thing that any prudent policy will entail will be to continue that military buildup, even though there is going to be huge pressure not to do that. It's not going to be easy to continue military spending at the level Trump proposes when the country is hurting so deeply. It's unlikely that that level of military spending will continue if President Trump loses because the other party has an entirely different philosophy about what the danger of, in the world is. To the Democratic Party and pre presidential candidate Biden in particular, the main danger is American power. Biden has claimed to be a faithful disciple of Obama. Let's take him at his word. And for Obama, the greater danger is us, not China. So whether we continue to undertake this provisional corrective that President Trump has taken, and that the Republicans in Congress have carried on in the aftermath of the coronavirus depends on what we do and don't do. Uh, although I'm focusing on China at this moment, we're witnessing the same temptation of our adversaries to take advantage of our distraction in the Middle East. Uh, since we spoke last, for those of you who are returning, the Iranians have intensified their provocative behavior uh, against American warships in the Persian Gulf. Even more dangerous, illustrating once and for all the fecklessness of President Obama's Iran deal, Iran, in the past few days, launched a satellite in space. Let me tell you what that means grimly. A uh, country that can launch a satellite into space is a country that can weaponize a ballistic missile 
with a nuclear warhead if that country crosses the nuclear threshold. So in the short term, we're going to face a set of enemies through a combination of opportunity and desperation in Iran's case and cynical exploitation of a crisis it created in China's case to take advantage of America's distractions. It's going to require a lot of fortitude, foresight, and leadership to remain committed, to stay the course of the military buildup and the trade policy and the emphasis on sovereignty that are necessary, if not sufficient, conditions for emerging from this crisis in this new environment with the United States substantially strengthened rather than gravely weakened. The second thing that a prudent policy would entail toward the dominant threat of China is the continuation and the acceleration of a substantial decoupling of our economies with China's, more specifically returning vital industries to American shores. Let me repeat Aristotle's ma maxim, the mark of intelligence politically is to make reasonable distinctions. That applies also to decoupling. Let me use the framework that Henry Kissinger used, identifying three different sets of presumptions for when and when not to use force in international relations. Kissinger said there are some things that are so vital that we should be willing to fight for them alone or in conjunction only with a limited coalition of the willing. Let me translate that into decoupling. There are some industries so essential that we cannot afford to outsource them to anybody unless it's dire necessity. That means our medicine. We can't afford to have 100% of our antibiotics produced offshore, much less have that 100% be produced in the country most threatening to us. So one of the things about decoupling is to understand the importance of reasonable distinctions. We can not achieve complete decoupling from the world economy. We shouldn't want to. Free trade in many ways has benefits. The problem with free trade with China has been simply that trade has not been genuinely free. It's been one-sided. But there are certain industries regardless, and this is for all my libertarian listeners. I won't say friends, usually they don't like me. I'm too much of an interventionist. <laughs> Read Adam Smith. Adam Smith, the proponent of free markets, wisely made an, an exception that libertarians sometimes neglect. National defense. You cannot put yourself in a position where you allow other countries to blackmail you. This happened by necessity, often with bad consequences. During the height of the Cold War in the Middle East, when, like it or not, we depended on the oil reserves of tyrannies that were unstable. And we had to make devil's bargains we didn't like. One of the liberating things about energy independence that President Trump has contributed to enormously unleashing the American productive sector in energy is we no longer have to make those bargains. What any sound president thinking strategically short term and long term and morally should want is to create a situation as best we can. We, we, are, we are never subject to blackmail 
for blandishment on critical industries because we're dependent on our enemies. So the first thing we have to identify is what are those things we have to produce here no matter what. The second thing, because decoupling shouldn't be total, is that when you do outsource, and here I think President Trump's record is better than his rhetoric, and some of the Trump people, uh, Michael Anton, Yoram Hazoni, insufficiently appreciate the importance of regime type. Mm -hmm. When you do outsource, you outsource to a friendly, reliable regime that sees the world not identically, but similarly to the way you do. That usually means a decent democratic government when possible. If we're going to outsource, if Apple is going to produce abroad, it should be in India, a decent democratic India with shared values, the rule of law, transparency, a common view of the geopolitical dangers we face, a rising Chinese tyranny, Islamic radicalism, it shouldn't be our enemies. It should be the Czech Republic. It should be Britain under Boris Johnson. It should be a decent democratic Israel so that when you do outsource, there's a high degree of reliability that you're outsourcing to a friend rather than enemies. And then there are times when desperate times requires desperate measures. When even under the best of circumstances, practically, you can't always produce what you need. You can't always outsource everything to countries that are politically reliable and congenial. But when you do outsource to regimes ranging on the spectrum from repressive to regimes to rogue tyrannies, you should limit the extent and duration of any of these bargains because what the coronavirus will remind anybody with any strategic sense is the danger. It is penny wise, pound foolish to rely on short term profits at the expense of your long term security. So, any sound policy besides continuing Trump's military buildup would also accelerate, broaden, deepen the already ongoing process of outsourcing, making these reasonable distinctions. A prudent policy dealing with China and the major threats of the world would also resist making the mistake that ritually we do make. The futility of courting Russia based on what I call unrealistic realism, not taking into account Putin as he is, rather than Russia as we want it to be. For now and the foreseeable future, Russia is an enemy, not a collaborator. For now and the foreseeable future, Russia is going to be with China, not against it. The cost of another reset with Russia we did it with Obama. It was Trump's early impulse. The cost is too high. The probability of success is too low to justify it. The fourth element of a prudent policy, again, bringing to mind the lyrics of uh, the title of one of my favorite Beach Boys songs, Wouldn't It Be Nice, is that as Mitt Romney called for, we would enlist the entire free world and others in this policy of not only deterring Putin, but decoupling and deterring China. That's gonna be easier said than done. It's not self-evident that the entire free world will follow us. Let me start with the good news first. The instincts and impulse of our present and prospective East Asian allies, the Indo-Pacific, 
the prognosis is better there. Uh, judging from their reaction to the corona crisis, the corruption of the World uh, Health Organization, which the Japanese uh, uh, assistant to the prime minister derided as the Chinese Health Organization, uh, India, Japan, South Korea, are going to be on board in, in, in the various aspects of the building blocks of what I call a prudent policy. We've already seen substantial Japanese decoupling. And I think that's going to continue. In Western Europe, however, the jury is still out. And the fifth thing that is absolutely essential if we are going to emerge from this crisis stronger to suit the conditions of the 21st century is to reassert the pro-democracy element in American foreign policy that Obama obliterated and President Trump has rhetorically de-emphasized, although his record has been better than his re rhetoric. Uh, this is, however, I think President Trump's weakest point in his overall outlook. This is the temptation uh, most likely to undermine President Trump's otherwise sound approach. There are a group of people, um, intellectuals who support Trump who have de-emphasized the importance of regime change uh, in favor of embracing undistinguished nationalism as an unmitigated good. It is, um, it's a positive good if it's rooted in sovereignty, freedom, and making reasonable distinctions between civic nationalism, which is good and inclusive, rooted in sovereignty, versus ethnic chauvinistic nationalism that can often transmigrate into imperialism. We have benefited enormously from all the problems, from all the controversies of individual cases. We've benefited enormously from the spread of freedom. Nothing should highlight the importance of freedom more than the coronavirus in particular and the Chinese threat in general, what caused the coronavirus to go global? Chinese tyranny. They hid it. They lied about it. There were no mechanisms to force disclosure. What's the wellspring of China's ambitions to dominate? The desire of the Communist Party to retain absolute power regardless of the cost or risk of anything else. Defending freedom is not only an American ideal, it's a self-interest. We can't do it everywhere. We have to make reasonable distinctions, but the idea prevalent in some of the rhetoric of President Trump and some of the rhetoric of his supporters, uh, his uh, speech in Vietnam, in December of 19, uh, December of 2017 to be, give you an example. The idea that, that we never undertake policies to encourage regime change is nonsense. And the other temptation that some of President Trump's supporters and some of President Trump's rhetoric rather than his actions seem to raise this danger as a possibility is to think that the United States can abdicate its role as the world's default power. Contrary to Rizzoni, who gives us these false binary distinctions, you're either an imperialist or a nationalist. The freedom of sovereign states depends on the United States exercising the role that it's exercised since World War II to remain as the world's default power in vital geopolitical regions. I have news for Zoni. Without the United States and American power, there'll be no sovereignty and freedom based on nationality 
in East Asia or in Europe. If you look at the historic record of Europe balancing without the United States, it goes from dismal to grim. Not the United States, Hitler wins World War II, the Soviet Union wins the Cold War. And if Europe collectively, particularly Western Europe, has shown the political will to deal with radical Islam, Putin, or China without the United States taking the lead, they have concealed it marvelously from me and everybody else. So if you want sovereignty rooted in nationality and freedom, you should be a proponent rather than an opponent of the United States retaining its role as the world's default power rooted in sovereignty and greater reciprocity. This is going to be a, the final issue is going to be a very difficult issue for any president to balance, including President Trump and Mitt Romney raised it when he called uh, today for an alliance of the free world. At what point does Trump's legitimate concern with reciprocity from allies, democratic allies, that have taken advantage of us in trade become counterproductive to building the type of national and international coalition we need to contain and deter China. But there's also a caveat to a caveat. That means that Europe in particular has to show reciprocity as well. Because the Europeans cannot continue to undermine us with Iran, with Israel, with China, and expect security for free. This recalibration is gonna require flexibility and commitment to the broader purpose on both sides. The upshot, President Trump is a necessary corrective on the issues of sovereignty, reshoring vital industries, reaffirming the importance of traditional geopolitical threats, alerting us to the danger of China. And there is a corrective to cor Trump's corrective, or at least the corrective of some of his supporters. We can't abandon our commitment to freedom, though we must pursue it prudently. The United States should remain the world's default power because it's penny wise and pound foolish, even for the goal of preserving freedom and sovereignty, not to perform that role. President Trump should recognize, especially after Corona, more than his rhetoric does, the importance of regime type in identifying friends, foes, threats, and opportunities. And finally, uh, what happens is contingent, not inevitable. Ronald Reagan warned us in his farewell address, although an optimist, every generation of Americans has to fight for its freedom. And you can lose it in a generation. And if you don't remember how you got it, you can lose it. This is our challenge. We have the opportunity to win it. China's economy is contracted by 6.8% this quarter, and things were going poorly even before that. There's nothing in this set of circumstances, short-term or long-term, that suggests, contrary to the Graham Allison Harvard view, that China's rise to number one is inevitable. Mm. But whether China dominates the world or whether the 21st century is another century where freedom is on the march and the United States is secure will depend on what we do and don't do. What I urge everybody listening to do when he or she goes into the ballot box in 2020 is to base their decision on what party and what president do you think is best equipped to follow the prudential policies necessary so that we have, to quote Lincoln, another new birth of freedom. 
Thanks for your forbearance. Thanks so much, Dr. Kaufman. I, we've got some questions coming in here um, about this decoupling. And it is a, it is a different perspective. Uh, we've just come from a class led by Dr. Lloyd looking at political economy and in ways that um, I think we haven't quite taken account of so much of our farm policy with China has been directed by economics and uh, at least expressed in a couple questions here the concern that the business community and I would read that as probably the larger corporate international business community, although even small businesses have relationships overseas. There is a concern that due to their political power, uh, America might not be able, uh, the government might not be able to make these decoupling decisions without significant headwinds uh, presented by America's own business community. And I wonder if you could, you could speak to that a little bit. Well, I have some good news that all is, is bad news, but ultimately good news. Uh, to quote our Sammy Kahn uh, song with Jules Stein, Frank Sinatra did two great versions of it. We've heard this song before. The business people uh, are necessary, but they have rotten foreign policy instincts. It's not new. Uh, during the uh, 1920s and early 30s, Henry Ford was selling factories to the Soviet Union and was a uh, pro-Nazi. During the Cold War, Pepsi and, and the, the business community and the banks uh, uh, got their shirts taken, uh, lending to Eastern Europe on the theory that this engagement would promote political freedom. It, it prolonged the existence of the Soviet Union. During the Cold War, organized labor had a better record dealing with the Soviet Union on what to do and how to do it than business. And, mm. and here, here's my optimism. This is an area where Trump's switch in, in the, uh, the gravity of the Republican Party away from the business community mm -hmm. and into and, and to be specific the larger corporate the larger business. corporate business community mm -hmm. and, and shifting it to the land of deplorables that bodes well for the united states because if you look at the history of, of of our challenges before the basic decency of main street mm -hmm. has often been much more reliable in not only identifying the danger but persevering rather than uh, having short-term concerns uh, outweigh your long-term strategic interests. So th this, this situation we're in with China in the, with the business community we've seen before, but, but the questioner has, has a very valid point. Because the extent and scope right. of the cooperation is so much deeper. Is much deeper. If you look at uh, the paradigm of this dangerous behavior, Apple that we've all revered. Oh, Apple isn't it wonderful? Apple is is a fundamental example of everything wrong in the approach of American business to outsourcing, thinking in the short term and thinking. Here's another Trump word that sovereignty no longer matters. Mm. We're international citizens. That the logic of trade, again, go back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith says free trade works, A, if it doesn't imperil your national defense, mm. B, the other side practices it, and you need, says Smith, not anarchy, but a rule of law, Very good. enforceable courts, Very and the protection of property rights. Apply those three caveats to China, you don't have free markets. So, so business thinking that when you go in and China takes a 51% equity position on any investment and steals your technology, yes. and Apple, oh yes, they manufactured all their phones. Yeah, they made money. And now China's stolen the technology and, and is uh, leading the 5G race. 
that uh, Apple is in the rear and not structurally ready to fight for to the great detriment of American security everywhere. So mm. the, 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 the questioner is raising a perennial issue, but the questioner is absolutely right to say, this is gonna pose a much greater challenge because to use another metaphor, we've drunk a lot more of the Kool-Aid yeah. relying on China. And it's going to take a lot of fortitude to decouple. Here's my uh, uh, other uh, retort, however. What the coronavirus is, is the ghost of Christmas future mm -hmm. for how things are going to go, not just in this instance, mm -hmm. but what the world will look like in a um, in a world in which there is no United States in a Belt and Road Initiative in China. Well, in a what, China century. Uh, yeah, what I would uh, urge people to do is sort of Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And imagine for the first half of a movie, the United States disappears or is enervated and the world is uh, China's based on the trajectory and behavior of this regime. Life for many people, to quote Hobbes, will be nasty, solitary, brutish, and maybe not short enough. I'm reminded as you speak, Dr. Kaufman, of one of our other faculty here, one of our economics faculty, Dr. Prieger, Dr. Jim Prieger, who was uh, teaching at a Chinese business school um, maybe four summers ago. And he told me about the story of that when he spoke with the Chinese students, they had this phrase for uh, describing the Chinese regime, which is another metaphor. And these were Chinese business students describing the Chinese government as having great hardware but bad software. Meaning, in other words, if you needed a bridge built in 18 minutes, they would make that happen. But the, so the software, the rule of law, um, these issues of, of, of trust and the importance of truth and transparency, those were basically non-existent. And certainly we've seen some really bad software. They can build a hospital in 20 minutes that we hope stands up over the test of time. But when it comes to these issues of, of transparency and rule of law, uh, they're being broken all over the place, it appears. I think that's true. And I think the way I put it in more political language, the economic language is, is valid, is that China is a parasitical regime. And mm. what's the root cause of this? The lack of freedom. Mm. Because that's why China steals intellectual property. That's why, by the way, uh, according to many accounts, we got into this predicament in the first place. What was going on in that lab is the Chinese scientists were uh, trying to demonstrate that they could compete with the United States. What China wants is the fruits of free inquiry without the free inquiry itself. It's a contradiction in terms. It's a kosher Nazi. And at a certain level, one of the reasons China comparatively took off is that for a time it became less repressive, never free, comparatively. What we're seeing now is the intimate linkage between tyranny and bad behavior and dangerous ambitions. Mm. This current leader is a neo-Maoist. This is not a capitalist economy. Go to the rating service Freedom House, which is venerable. They have a scale of one to seven political freedom. China's a 6.5, meaning almost totally unfree. Don't like that? Go to the Wall Street Journal Heritage Foundation uh, uh, Index of Economic Freedom. Contrary to legend, since most Chinese industry is owned directly or indirectly by the state, and that percentage is growing, China rates on a scale of one to seven at a 6.5, unfree. So what we're seeing is hmm. the lack of freedom the in China manifesting itself across the board economically, politically, and militarily. That's why we should care about what happens in China. So we have a couple of questions which I think are, are very valid and uh, legitimate on, in responding to your call and uh, apparently Senator Romney's call for 
having this event actually trigger greater cooperation among free nations. And the, the questions center around the perception of President Trump of being not a particularly collaborative person, both individually, but also as, as president. Um, your thoughts, you, you seem to support this call for greater international cooperation, but President Trump's uh, perceived and in some cases real uh, lack uh, uh, inability uh, to, to reach out and build those kinds of alliances. Rolling stones, you, you, you don't always get what you want, but, but sometimes you get what you need. Yeah. Um, it, it's very easy, and Mitt Romney tried it in, in 2012 when Candy Crowley uh, interjected herself on Benghazi, and, and he was a perfect gentleman, a perfect candidate for the Skull and Bones Society of Yale, as he meekly, politely let Candy Crowley defang a very legitimate point. Uh, if we were having this conversation in 1938 or 1940, go to this wonderful movie on Churchill. No one wanted Churchill because Churchill was a disruptor. When you're fighting against a stifling consensus, whether it's nature, nurture, or believe it or not, God's providence, a typical politician was not going to break through. You needed, I'm from the Northeast, I have four Columbia degrees. You needed an outer boroughs, New York brawler. Now, a Trump disruptor is not sustainable as a method of governance over the long term. This is the Victor Davis Hanson tragic hero yes. thesis, how which you, I agree with. How you. do you institutionalize? Right. Very good. What Trump brings to the table that was absolutely necessary. Very good. And Victor and I have talked about this. Like Shane, like the man who, uh, who shot Liberty Valance, John Wayne, Tom Donovan, it may be that once we have rediscovered what made us free in the first place, Trump has to ride out of town because we're uncomfortable with his temperament as mm -hmm. a permanent solution. Mm -hmm. But what people ought to recognize is that irrespective of your particular um, lack of, um, his lack of coup, which may be an element in his success at this point, Trump's not a man for all seasons, mm -hmm. but he may be a man for this one. And as Plato uh, pointed out, I'm, I'm not uh, Plato's Republic person, uh, you need guardians who uh, sometimes uh, are, do the types of things in certain situations that normal society can't do. And I think Trump, when he goes, may personally come to a bad end, but a lot of the things that he put on the table mm. were long overdue and it may be, uh, as the Old Testament says, Isaiah Berlin put in the book title, The Crooked Timber of Humanity, God Uses Crooked Timber. Mm -hmm. It may be that it takes somebody like this to break through a consensus on China that was so stifling, That's, yeah. so deep, so broad, that it took a wrecking ball rather than etiquette to and put to it on your, the table. Well, first I'd say you're aware that at the conclusion of most of President Trump's rallies, he plays exactly that Rolling Stones right. tune. But, but I, I'm, I'm going to take a big swing at American universities uh, mm. that symbolizes this problem of how to break through a consensus. This is why our school is here. Why is it that there are 86 Confucian societies, Chinese propaganda mills operating on American campuses, including elite campuses like Stanford and Tufts? disseminating Chinese propaganda, that's less controversial than defending Donald Trump or Israel on an American campus. Mm -hmm. If you wanted sort of distill the essence of the perversity of American education and the stifling effect of a consensus that needs a wrecking ball, that's it. And, uh, Donald Trump, for all his warts, 
is the first and was the only candidate of 2016 for all his problems conceptually that even would have put us in a position where we would be talking about sovereignty, where we mm. would be talking about China, mm. where would we be talking about resourcing, mm -hmm. which would we would be talking about uh, border security. So for all his flaws, um, and people may not want to admit it in polite society, even if you don't disagree, agree with him, he is a force to be reckoned with and taken seriously. So we're going to, I'll just let students know, we're going to run about five minutes late, um, just because we have some good questions and this is such a terrific conversation. Um, and again, we are, we're going to be sending around the full recorded session to everyone who's registered. Um, there is another question related to this decoupling, um, which uh, I, I think would be, it would be an interesting way to look at uh, tax policy as a form of foreign policy, right? Which is to say that are there, there certainly are tax policies related to manufacturing and business practices that relative to other countries, even though we, we have dropped corporate tax rates. Um, you know, there still are, could be argued that there's a ways to go there. Um, could, could an argument be made regarding tax policy that in the interest of decoupling and in the interest of bringing manufacturing back to the United States, that those two need to be seen as closely aligned, that we need to be more aggressive, if you will, in dropping tax rates in order to incentivize businesses? One, even if this crisis hadn't occurred, the corporate tax is a double tax. It's a bad idea. And for many years, uh, we had a much higher corporate tax, which is why there were trillions of dollars offshore. And one of the things that led to the Trump recovery after the anemic Obama years, weakest recovery from a recession in history, is that offshore money coming back? So yes, economically it makes sense. Yes, it makes double sense to uh, encourage further the reshoring of industry. And the Japanese are doing not only version of that right now, but actually subsidizing some of their corporations to relocate, to reshore to Japan. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it, the corporate tax for many reasons should go down, including this one, but I would even broaden that question uh, or broaden the remedy and say, how can we encourage including tax policy, right. especially essential industries to reshore here or to reshore to more reliable countries and to have a, a set of criteria, like if there's a terrorist list, why not a positive list? Mm. Why not have the Commerce Department do something useful for a change and say, here are the countries that are reliable countries for American trade of, um, of in, in terms of, and, and, and offshoring uh, of industries that may have national security significance. So I wanna conclude with, with a couple, just a quick questions, if I could get quick uh, answers to. One is um, you, you've raised the prospect of, of shifting alliances, again, as part of this decoupling strategy, not only to bring more manufacturing back to the United States, but to also shift it into other countries that might be more amenable. And you raised India as one of those. Obviously, President Trump and, and uh, Prime Minister Modi have, have shown uh, some collegiality, uh, maybe closer than almost any other leader that we've seen, maybe aside from Abe in, in Japan. Talk a little bit about, it, it, are there concerns that you'd have in, in shifting to India? Obviously, these are all about trade-offs. But while they are a, a democracy, um, there could be some questions around rule of law, around uh, the security of, of patents and intellectual property. Yeah, there were concerns, but it's a matter of degree. Modi has not... Uh, done as much as fast to move in a free market direction. There's a heavy protectionist lobby in, in India. That said, the building blocks for the rule of law and for all of India's problems 
uh, it has remained a largely free society when it didn't possess any of the traditional met metrics of economic development. So ideally, are there problems? Should we worry about Modi's propensity to appeal to Hindu nationalism? Does his record in Gujarat raise that? Mm -hmm. uh, those are legitimate concerns, mm -hmm. but again, this is a balance sheet. Uh, I think, and I'm, I wanna pay tribute to George W. Bush here. George W. Bush is one of his most unsung legacies, was this historic shift mm -hmm. to making the United States committed to the rise of India as a great power for moral and geopolitical reasons rooted in shared values and also uh, straight, shared strategic sense. So let me put the question back to whoever asked it. Uh, for 30 years, we've made that bet with China. Right. Yeah. The fundamentals are much better to How's make that, that bet out? with India, yeah. regardless of the, uh, the legitimate concerns uh, and, and uncertainties. We just had the NFL draft. Um, I hate to say it, you Green Bay Packers did the right thing there, I think. As, as Dan Schnur uh, texted me, we, we're, we're looking really good for 2027. Yeah, but... <laughs> But it's a calculated risk. I, I think if I'm an investor, um, I, I like the bet of India on all the fundamentals for all the legitimate concerns raised much better than uh, China. If you want Modi or this Chinese leader, yeah. uh, I, I will take Modi uh, hands down any day, not only on this issue, but on things ranging to Modi's deep cooperation uh, with India that represent uh, Israel that represents a, a positive departure from the the, uh, the uh, previous uh, Gandhi uh, approach mm -hmm. to the Middle East. Uh, do I have a do I have the microphone for a final question? Yes. Okay, Sid Denau, if you're out there, I'll just ask you a question without prejudging it. Um, do you want to sell Israel down the river in the election of 2020, um, voting against the guy who moved the embassy to Jerusalem? I just raised that question for you, and I hope that causes you considerable embarrassment and heartburn. On that note, uh, because many of your the classes that you teach end in heartburn for the students, uh, some of whom are on this and the administration. <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Kaufman, Bob. This has been such a pleasure. Pleasure to do. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I want to thank all of you for, for uh, joining us over this series. I know not only those on the screen, but at least another 120 or so have registered and are going to get the, the recorded session. You should feel free to share those. We'll be also circling back with um, information about Dr. Kaufman's other books, as I've seen a couple questions come through here about those. And uh, we've also gotten some questions about, are we going to continue this series into May? And, and uh, that those are conversations that we're having. Uh, we don't have uh, plans today uh, to continue. We do have a session with Andy Puzder scheduled for next Tuesday, uh, just a single session on Tuesday at 2.30. Uh, I'll be in, uh, interviewing Andy to look at uh, reopening policy here in the United States and, and what are the criteria that Andy thinks we should be considering. Um, but we'll also keep you all updated as we plan for future sessions. I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, this has been a real success, this experiment that we've had with these online sessions. And uh, again, great to have you all with us over these uh, last few weeks. We'll definitely stay in touch. Please stay safe out there. Uh, God bless and, uh, and take care.